are you at home? I'm at home. Okay. All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you here tonight um, from wherever you're joining us this evening. My name is Sam. I work here at Third Place Books and work in our author events program. If you've ever been to one of our stores, you might recognize me from readings past. And right now, of course, we're doing all of our readings online, um, a uh, program that I started cheekily referring to back during quarantine as Third Place Books from our living room. But as you can see tonight, I'm here in our store uh, where you can recognize maybe if you know our Lake Forest Park store, this uh, royal purple curtain behind me um, in our stage area. I am so glad to be here tonight with two writers who are like, to, to me, growing up um, in, in bookstores, haunting bookstores and libraries, uh, these are two giants of modern American letters, and I am thrilled to have them both virtually here with us tonight. I think this is going to be an amazing conversation. We've been having a great time behind the scenes already. So uh, get ready. This is going to be a great evening. Before we begin, I have just a couple of quick announcements. Tonight, of course, we are here to celebrate a book, as we are any time we do this. And the book is In the Valley. It's the new collection from Ron Rash. It has an incredibly cool cover. I love the presentation of this book. I love the concept behind it. Uh, just flipping through and reading the first paragraph I was telling Dorothy Allison, reading, just reading the first paragraph of the first story, I was just hit in the chest by it. Um, I think you're going to agree with me. And uh, by the end of the talk, I'm almost certain that you will. And if you want to buy a copy of In the Valley tonight, you can do so. There's a buy the book button. It is down at the bottom of your screen. It actually might be on this side because it might be mirrored. Uh, it's a green button. You can go ahead and click on it. It'll take you through to thirdplacebooks.com where you can order a copy of In the Valley. And we will ship it to you anywhere in the United States. USPS Media Mail supporting our United States Post Postal Service, which uh, small businesses like okay. to rely on. And uh, if you're here in Seattle, you can also have it available for pickup at one of our three neighborhood locations, Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park. Uh, you can grab a copy there, or you can put one aside tonight and uh, pick it up at any point. And no matter how you pick up your book, uh, just thank you so much for your book purchase and for your support. Your book purchase is what sustains this author events program, is what sustains third place books, especially during this highly unusual year. It is also what keeps authors like Ron Rash available, able to write, and uh, able to stay on the road, whether virtually or in person, and able to keep working. Authors like Dorothy Allison is what supports these writers who you love and allows them to keep telling the stories that we love them for. So. Don't be shy. Pick up a copy tonight. I think you'll love it. And uh, it is, this is a book that has been uh, published a very, very high praise indeed. So um, we hope that you'll hit that buy the book button and we'd love to send you a copy of In the Valley. We're doing a lot of these events right now, two to three of them a week, um, mostly on this platform, Crowdcast. And if there's something else that you'd like to see, I encourage you to go on our website, thirdplacebooks.com, check out our online events calendar, see what else we've got coming up. We have some great events, some ticketed events with folks like Frederick Bachman and uh, Helen McDonald, the author of H's for Hawk, and also so many free uh, to register for events with all sorts of great authors, local, national, international, authors from all over the world. There's sure to be something else you'll enjoy. You can sign up for our email newsletter there. You can follow us on social media at Third Place Books on most platforms. And you can also even follow us on this platform, Crowdcast, where you'll get a notification anytime we go live with a new event. Finally, I know many of you will probably have questions for Ron tonight, and we are here for that. Uh, at the end of the evening, we'll leave some time for questions. If you have one, you can drop it into the Ask a Question box. It is conveniently located below the Buy the Book button. Um, so when you're visiting that, you can also check out the question and answer box. Put your question in there. We'll get to it at the end of the event. And uh, thank you so much again for, for your attention and for attending this evening. And now, without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce uh, the two authors joining me on screen here. Ron Rash, uh, somebody we've been looking forward to hosting uh, since we first saw In the Valley announced. Ron Rash is the author of the Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena, uh, on which In the Valley is, is based and tied in with. In addition to the critically acclaimed novels, The Risen, Above the Waterfall, The Cove, One Foot in Eden, Saints of the River, The World Made Straight, 
four collections of poems, six collections of stories, among them Burning Bright, which won the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, Nothing Gold Can Stay, a New York Times bestseller, and Chemistry and Other Stories, which was a finalist for the 2007 Penn Faulkner Award. Twice the recipient of the O. Henry Prize, winner of the 2019 Sidney Lanier Prize for Southern Literature, he's Paris Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University. Tonight he's joining us from North Carolina. And joining Ron, is Dorothy Allison. Yes, that Dorothy Allison, the author of <laughs> South Carolina. She grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, the first child of a 15-year-old unwed mother who worked as a waitress. The first member of her family to graduate from high school, Dorothy Allison attended the Florida Presbyterian College on a National Merit Scholarship and then studied anthropology at the New School for Social Research. She's now living in Northern California, uh, which has been an exciting place to be the last couple of days, and we're very, very glad that she is able to join us tonight. She describes herself as a feminist, a working class storyteller, a Southern expatriate, a sometime poet, and a happily born again Californian in spite of everything. Please, from wherever you are joining us tonight, put your hands together for Ron Rash and Dorothy Allison. Wow. wow. <laughs> Very nice. He's kind of sweet. He's in Seattle. Are we talking Seattle? <laughs> Third place books. Do you realize that we are like a big triangle of the United States? He's in yeah. Seattle. You're in North Carolina, and I'm in Northern California. It's like an isosceles of some kind. Yeah. Cool. That is. Cool. I'm glad to be here. With one of my favorite people. Hey, baby. <laughs> so you're going to read something for us? I thought I'd start off. Uh, Good. This is from the novella in the valley. And uh, I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know. Are y'all? A little, but it don't matter. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the story of in the valley in which Serena Pemberton returns. And it's, uh, I, I, I thought, how can I have Serena come back to North Carolina? And I thought she, she should come like a Valkyrie <laughs> and descend from the heavens. And so she does in this particular scene. This is 1931. She's uh, taken Killed her husband by now. She's gone to, uh, you know, back to, uh, she's gone to Brazil, founded a new empire, and now she's coming back. So this is uh, when she comes back. And, and some of you who know uh, uh, something of uh, World War II and, and journalists, there was one very intrepid journalist named, uh, you may remember her, uh, she was married to Ernest Hemingway. And oh, so yeah. we'll, I'll let you guess at that. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's not echoing. I can hear you. Oh, just echoing here. It's a little okay. echoey, but I can hear you. Okay. When Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore's seaplane in July of 1931, a small but contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone. Those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina. All except for her minion Galloway who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was ready, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stuff protruding from one sleeve. Okay, somebody's telling me, yeah, someone just saying that they're not here now. If you- Put your you, headphones on, he says. Do you have headphones, uh, baby? I don't have headphones. Uh, oh, well. Uh, 
Is there anything else All right. I can do? If you mute when you're talking, how do I? Do I don't that? have a mute button. Do you have a mute button? Let's see. I'm sure I do. Uh, Pity I can't send my girlfriend to help you. She set my system up, and I don't have a clue how it works. Yeah. I may get my, my neighbor who actually knows how to do this. Ann, can you tell Tommy to come over here? <laughs> There's got to be a way. That's it. That's it. That's how it works. Call the neighbor in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. We, we can talk till he gets that to fix. Well, listen, now. Uh, can you help me, Sam? Do you know? I, well, I sure, I sure can try. I, I think, um, you know, you, one thing you could do if uh, uh, the reason I recommended the headphones is that'll uh, that'll cut out some of that. But you can also just turn off the volume on your computer while you're talking. Okay. Um, so usually, if you if you press like the mute button, or if you go down to uh, the the let's see, depending on where your computer, which you what kind of computer you have. I sure can, yeah. Okay, that's good. I think. All right. Uh, let's try this again. <laughs> when Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore seaplane in July of 1931, a small but fervent contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina, all except for her minion Galloway, who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was ready, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stump protruding from one sleeve. As cameras flashed inches from his face, he did not blink. As Serena descended, the first question shouted at her addressed the rumors surrounding her husband's death. For a moment, it didn't appear she would answer, but when her booted feet settled securely on the ground, the question was asked again, but with a caveat. Had she loved her husband? I love my husband, but one always learns from disappointments. <laughs> but what of his death, Mrs. Pemberton? And what of so many others of your acquaintance? The reporter asked. Logging is a dangerous business, she answered. Galloway was in front of her now, but Serena, almost a head taller, was clearly visible. He cleared the path as more questions came. Would she continue to fight against the National Park? And would she address the rumor that she was connected to the recent demise of Horace Kephart, the park's chief advocate? Did she oppose the Davis-Bacon Act? Why risk a transatlantic enterprise when she and her husband had achieved so much in the States? Galloway opened the DeSoto's passenger door. Serena was about to get in when the sole woman in the group, a reporter for the New Republic, stepped close. She was very young, but like Serena, tall and blonde. When will you have achieved all your ambitions, Mrs. Pemberton, she asked, as others jostled around them. When the world and my will are one. Serena answered. This is a scary bitch. And that, uh, the woman, some of you probably have figured out, is was Martha Gellhorn. Yeah. I, I thought I, she, she'd find uh, Serena as a good role model. She's a role model for some, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you read beautifully, darling. Thank you. Well, you do too. Well, I think we should get a choir behind us, get a bus, and go cross country. <laughs> I'm a little. I'm trying to figure out this whole online crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, zooming. I'm too old for this shit. Just set it up and get out of my way. 
Unfortunately, my girlfriend's a techie and she sets me up and gets out of my way. Well, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I neither, uh, I, I am not. And uh, uh, so I have neighbors and a son who can help me. That's it. We get through with help from our friends. So when did you finish these stories? I've been, I've, I've been working on them for probably the last three or four years. Um, yeah. Several of the stories were more were were very recent. I mean, in the sense of right before you know, in this part this year. Um, yeah. And um, but I've been I've got I had about eighteen or nineteen stories. But as you know, I mean, when I put a, a short story collection together, to me, it's something it's similar to what I, I think most musicians do when uh, they create a a CD. I wanted, you want them to be, the individual stories to be, when you read them together, uh, more, uh, you know, the sum of the parts is yeah. quite, you know, greater than the individual uh, yeah. stories. And I felt like these, these stories and the kind of movement through time, I, 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 I did, you know, did in the collection, but more the tone uh, yeah. kind of fit the world we're in right now. So I, I was very selective. I had a couple oh. of humor stories, but they just didn't seem to fit this book. I can see why. I don't think we're living in humorous times unless it's a deep black humor. Yeah. But, you know, I I really love the shape of the stories. I love the range of the stories. Mostly I love your people. I know these people. And you write, you write with such respect for those individual desperate humans. Makes yeah. me... That's what I mean. You can tell me terrible, terrible people and terrible, terrible events, and somehow you make me happy. <laughs> so, <damn. laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, your door Weldy once said that we should, as writers, we should never condescend to our characters. And I, I've always thought that was a really nice piece of advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was your Dora Welty. <laughs> <laughs> You're Ron Rash. That story, Flight, mm -hmm. that story, you write with such restraint about the violence in women's lives that it just breaks my heart. And it's so hard to find people who can write true and from the inside and make me understand that girl from a whole different, I mean, we're going along and I'm getting her and I'm following along and I'm being, oh, okay, this is one of Ron's women. And then, and then you get her as an eight-year-old and that one flash, and everything changes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I find in all your stories. I'll be going along, there'll be events and then there'll be a moment of revelation where you'll give me that inherent respect. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what I try to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I hope that's my hope. Uh, I've, I've always tried to, to, to give that, you know, respect to the, to the characters and also their situations. So William Faulkner has a great quote. Uh, he says that he believed that most people, most people were a little bit better than their circumstances ought to allow. That's nice. Yeah. That's and, nice. and I think, that that to me is where for me is 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 one of the most interesting aspects when trying to create character. Yeah. And and but but it's all it's, it's it's most it's not all because I have characters who also you know who do not who, who behave in worse ways. But oh yeah. But I think a lot of times uh, the characters I find most interesting are those that are at least attempting, even wrongheadedly, to be a little bit better. There was a story you wrote about uh, crack addicts and that whole scene where the, the man goes out and to where the crack, addict, crack addicts are living and the parents are living in a mobile home or a trailer out in the yard and the son and his girlfriend are in the house, which is, you know, a complete wreck. Well, I live down the road from my local drug dealer and I watch all the meth addicts come up the hill and every time they come up the hill, I remember that story. And there is a way in which, you know, I'm not going to throw rocks at them. I'm not even going to threaten them. I'm just going to watch them and see a Ron Rash character coming up the hill. It's, it's a human dimension that you give to people, even even people who have become terrible to themselves, you know? It gives me hope when I read your stories, baby. Well, that's, 
that's as good a compliment as I could ask. I was telling somebody uh, today that, uh, you know, Dorothy Allison likes my book. I don't care about anybody else. You know? <laughs> if I can please Dorothy. And, and the one thing I do know that if I do, that the kind of, you know, as you say, the, the characters I'm writing about, you know them. Yeah. In yeah. ways that a lot of readers wouldn't. And you know whether it's, I'm getting it pretty close at least. Well, you and I are always also writing against the myth of the Southern writer. And yeah. let me just say, we got this whole, in some ways it's an advantage, you know, because we're a genre and people will, we get our own shelf, Southern writers. Uh, but I'm living in California and I'm looking mm -hmm. around me and I'm seeing people I recognize from my childhood and hearing stories that are Ron Rash stories. It's just, you haven't written them yet because you ain't been here. I'm tempted to drag your ass out here so you learn a little bit about these folks. They don't eat well, right, but other it than that, sounds like they're, you're, they're already familiar, though. Uh, and yeah, that, you know, I think that's one. I think that's what we really hope for yeah. as writers is that that you know that what we're if we go deep enough into a place that you know maybe we'll hit something that'll ripple out just beyond that particular place. Um, and uh, I mean, that, uh, that's my hope. Uh, Some of but, your stories, you know, though. People, you know, people just view our characters as freaks. Yeah. Uh, you know, exotics. Uh, I failed. Scary sons of bitches. I do like scary sons of bitches. Let's not get wrong. But yeah. I don't like being, I don't like having every one of my people seen on some level as scary sons of bitches. Yeah. I like yeah. when I get a one of the things I love in your characters is that you'll give me moments in which they're purely human. And, but Ron, you've got a gift for raising it to the sublime. You've got a gift for making, making people understandable who otherwise I wouldn't understand. And then these stories, each and every story, I find the core of that. It really, it really does give me an enormous amount of emotional strength to read your fiction. Well, well I know absolutely. it's hard for me. I'll nice. say nice things and you'll get all yeah, embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I plan you to outlive me so you can be at mine. <laughs> or we'll get Randall to hold a service. <laughs> oh, Randall no. Keenan could ghost for both of us. Yeah. Well, but I think you're bringing up something that I, that I really feel. And um, I was actually talking about this when I teach uh, my uh, fiction writing class that I always like to use uh, Bastard Out of Carolina because I say there's a moment in that novel, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> late in it where a the mother has to make a decision. Yeah. And I said 95% writers, even good writers, would not have made that decision that she made in that novel. Yeah, I said, you were too honest time. a writer not to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had several students who had read it, and and they, and they they understood exactly what uh, uh, I was talking about. Yeah, I mean that to me was that that you know a lot of times right you know I hate I kind of get tired sometimes hearing people talk about how brave writers are, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean I don't consider myself brave, but I, I but I do think there is something about honesty, and maybe if you want to call some of that brave yeah. courage yeah. I, I don't know but particularly when you wrote that book i thought that was a really uh honest and it, you know it goes against what the reader wants what you lose track of is it's easier to be brave in a room with a locked door at a long distance from the people that'll shoot you in the right. head you know <laughs> um, but it's also i think the 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 need for bravery that both you and I confront constantly is that I don't want to deny or lessen or humiliate the people I love when I put them on the page. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel in a great story um, in which really the language has to rise above the characters to carry the characters. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like gospel music or good good country western we're going to differentiate between some of that bonk -a doodle shit and good good music we're trying to do good music we're trying to sing a powerful song 
Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's a locked door. <laughs> there's a great quote uh, about country music. I can't remember who said it, but he said it's three chords and the truth. Right, right. Well, you can give me two chords and a lie, and I'll follow you further. <laughs> but it's got to be a good damn lie. You tell good damn lies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Baby, I just, I'm, this feels so surreal. It's like, Talking to you when you're on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast, it's like our words flying back and forth across the country. It's a hell of a thing. I it feel is, almost we ancient. Haven't even got an interpreter. Yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> trying to explain to our grandmothers what we are doing here? It's just, <laughs> my grandmother wouldn't use a telephone. She didn't trust them. She thought they sucked something out of your brain. <laughs> <laughs> she, she may have been right <laughs> she may have been right especially a cell phone jesus christ <laughs> what do you want this book to do baby really oh that's always a tough question i, I think one thing is I, i've really tried hard in my writing never to repeat myself and yeah. when I, I knew i didn't want to write a sequel to serena i I, I, I'm very, I didn't want to do Ghostbusters too. Yeah. So that was a big part of this. And yet there was a character, particularly a character even more than Serena, uh, a guy named Ross, a logger. And I always felt, even when I was working on Serena, there was a lot to, lot more to him than oh, I yeah. realized. And I said, well, you know, I really want to go back and revisit these characters. Part of it was because of what's happening. Yeah, I wrote Serena in 2008 and two, 2006 too, because, uh, you know, the the uh, administration, the government was starting to try to break into the uh, national parks and wilderness areas. God, I know. And I, that, I was writing about that fear, but you know, now it, it's not, it's no longer fear. I mean, it's real. I'm sure you know what's happening in Alaska with the salmon fishery. You know what's happening to a lot of the wilderness land. <sighs> And yeah. so I just wanted to go, one thing I wanted to do was kind of go back and remind people how hard won these national forest and, and wilderness areas uh, were and how easily lost. So uh, in, uh, in the novella, at least, uh, the, the valley becomes a metaphor for um, uh, like a Noah's Ark, except instead of the animals coming there to be safe, uh, they, they start moving out. And I actually go kind of down the chain from the larger yeah. mountain all the way down to the amphibians so you start to see this uh this disintegration of a of, of a chain a biological chain and of course we're in it too so yeah you know that that was a big part of it and uh i think trying to kind of uh, uh maybe to be a little i mean this sound well you, you kind of said it i mean uh, that i felt like the characters and the stories i chose for the most part of people in really bad situations, but they're doing the best they can. Yeah, minute to minute. It's, yeah. I don't think I've ever read anything that equals the ruthlessness of the rich in this country as Serena and the story in your in this new collection that addresses it. Just the, the willing to destroy people and an almost almost sexual enjoyment of the destruction and contempt of people that they feel are lesser than them. Serena has it in spades. Uh, Donald Trump has it near as I can tell. The rich have it in this country. And we used to have this notion that for the, you know, the rich and the prosperous had some responsibility and some sense of gifting and protecting the nation. Um, I think that the use of books like and stories that you're writing is to call back to that. And to put and to put a contrast between what we are enduring and what the kind of life that Serena has made uh, yeah. compared to the Laura and Jacob who run away to Seattle and survive by oh, by sheer intervention of an axe and fate. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad you used that axe so well in that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that's interesting to me, and I, I suspect you know this is true, that during as terrible as the cotton mills were, yeah. and uh, my grandmother went into a cotton mill at 14, uh, which, you know, was not that unusual then, but I can remember 
during the dep- I mean, I don't remember the, but she told me one time that during the depression, the mill owner made sure that every family had a certain amount of work to survive. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying, I mean, yes, it was exploitive in many ways, but, but I think kind of what you're talking about, there was at least a sense with that particular, uh, mill owner that, you know, uh, I do have some responsibility. These people have done so much for me. Yeah. And or a and, sense and, of know, a community to that. And and I I just can't even imagine a, a corporate major corporation even thinking that way now. Yeah. It's scary. Need more stories. More stories that really show how this works. But right. every now and again a shred of hope. To me, Laura in Seattle with Little Jacob is a shred of hope, and I'm I'm glad to have read that the news story because it gives me more of her story. Yeah, Boy, you yeah she's out there doing well in Seattle. Yeah, yeah that's what I hear. <laughs> yeah, that's where she is, uh, enjoying it and feeling safe. So that you know, I hadn't thought of that till just now, but yeah, yeah, this should be a good good conversation since we're actually uh, for a bookstore in Seattle. <laughs> got maybe uh, Rachel's granddaughter and maybe they're all watching this who knows but uh yeah I I, yeah. I do feel good and I you know she, and she's brave I mean yeah uh, that's what I also I mean you know there are certain characters that you start to care a little more for than the others and and she yeah. was one that I kind of uh really uh came to care about I, I wanted her to get away uh, from yeah. Serena and uh, you don't but you don't yeah. always give me that kind of thing and and that you gave it to me was a great gift, <laughs> me than all the other readers who are going to find it. But you give me characters like that. The the young woman in flight, you give me that character. She's she's made her place in her safe place. Yeah. 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 Every now and again, Ron. Every now and again, you give us a little hope. <laughs> a little. You always give me. You always give me great language and complicated characters, but you don't always give me much hope, son. Yeah. Well, we need it right now, you know. Uh, God, yes. But it, it's funny because how people perceive me. You know me well enough, but uh, I went in uh, uh, to a, my uh, rec. We actually, our rec centers are still open. And, and I went in there, and, and the woman who works there, and I, I've known her for probably 20 years, uh, said that, well, you know, what am I thinking on your books? And, she, and I, I just mentioned that I knew, you know, I knew you that he can't, you come in like two or three times a week. And, uh, said well what's he like you know, and, uh, and and the person said well you know he's friendly he says uh, hi he always says she said what's he really like i think she was expecting her to say yeah he's really disturbed <laughs> <laughs> we're writers we're all disturbed yeah I think it's funny that we both have children who are trying to write books or stories. I've got a 28-year-old son who's writing his first novel. And you got, how old is your girl? She's 30, 31 now. So, you know, grown-ups. Grown-ups making a strange and interesting choice. <laughs> they should know better watching us. <laughs> well, I warned, I warned her. You know, I warned her about, uh, you know, being... Uh, you know, uh, a writer. She knows what it's like. She's seen me, yeah. uh, and my, you know. But uh, but I also warned her not to teach uh, because her parents are teachers, and uh, she's done it anyway. And my son has taught it <laughs> now, a principal, vice principal. We can't control them, and I gave that up long ago. But I, I, it's interesting to see that coming down in generations that they want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, must have modeled I, something. Yeah, one thing that I find heartening is I believe that people and, and, and it's been very nice for me to see young people, maybe not as many as we'd hope, but to realize that there's something that happens reading the printed page that it's it, it is the most interactive yeah. uh, I think way you, of any art form because all you're giving the uh the uh, reader uh, just watches the thing. And so the reader has to uh, come into that. And uh, and and if the, if the reader is visibly moved or if the reader sees the scene, I mean, the reader's creating this book too. And I love yeah. that idea of communion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I felt that, you know, when I was young, that you have this sense of 
real connection. It's true. It's true. It's funny. I've just we've just gone through ten days of raging fires, and we've evacuated twice, and we're back at the house. And when you, we had like twenty four hours to pack up everything and run. And I don't even want to think about how all of that worked. We we went, we came back. We're 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 sort of okay now, but packing the car to run, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, I gotta put. Let's get some macaroni and some rice, and I'm even gonna need the camp stove, and we need water, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm. Oh, I'm gonna need at least three changes of clothing, and then I had to grab a bag of books because I had this inch notion that we're gonna get down in, you know, south of here, parked on the side of the road with a truck and and the van, and I'm gonna go crazy if I haven't got at least a half a dozen books to keep me sane. Yeah. I keep saying reading books. Without books, I'd lose my mind, especially watching the fire creeping toward my home. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then well, I find that I'm reading more since the pandemic. And it's not that yeah. I have more time necessarily, but I need it. I need yeah. it. And uh, I remember uh, years ago, someone said, it may have been Fred Chapel, I'm not sure, but he said that people do not need poetry until they really need it. Yes, and they really need it. <laughs> we need something that can kind of lift us up. Uh, poetry does that, I think, best, particularly in times of great stress or yeah. uh, tragedy. I mean, yeah. that's why I think you you see at, at memorial services. You know, we need that exalted. But I think prose can do that as well. I mean, I think that it it can give give us something. The sublime, I would, you know, that would be the term the great ones would give us. Uh, and uh, we need that. We need that kind of nourishment. Uh, and we need story. And I think partly because we need some kind of coherence. Well, it helps you also to look outside your own life or look at your <laughs> life as a story. And I've always found that helpful. I always told myself, I'm going to have a great ending. <laughs> I'm going to have triumph and justification and great sex all on the page. <laughs> good for you. Well, it sorts how I pick books up, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's very hard to try and to sort what I would, I, I found myself putting in the bag of books, you know, half a dozen new ones that have that I've picked up in the last few months, but a half a dozen of old ones that I know that I, I can read again and take energy and strength from. And that's how I feel about the stories that you write, Ron. Even the ones I've read over and over again, I want to read again. You know, I can read The World Made Straight any day, any day, and it will make me feel like the world makes sense. <laughs> Well, that's that's great. I'm glad yep. it does that. It's uh, this you is know, a practice I, of humiliation. You got to accept right compliments. Now, I'm, I'm, I am kind of going back to books that I've read before. It's kind of, it's like revisiting friends. It really is, and yeah. uh, it's interesting how our tastes change. Uh, but a lot. It, it's wonderful. I, sometimes I fear if I read a you know a book that meant so much to me, perhaps in my twenties. I'm going to yeah. go back and be disappointed. And occasionally that happens. But I, for the most part, I just come away and say, wow, how much more was in this? And it's because of, of living. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you know, we've lived long enough. And that's one reason when I, I taught community college for uh, 17 years. And what I loved were night classes because I, I would teach literature class. Mm -hmm. But they, these were older students. These were students that had jobs. You know, some of them were in their 30s, 40s, yeah, and 50s even. And when when we read literature, they got it because they. I, I can remember a, a woman. We read To a Mouse by Robert Burns, and and she oh. said, you know, six months ago my trailer got destroyed, and I felt like that. You know that my, I mean, what he was talking about—the best laid plans of mice and men—and yeah. those students got it. You know, and and they were so hungry. And that that's still probably the best. No, it is the best uh, experience teaching experience. I teach at a university now, and I have a lot of nice students. But it, it, those students—they it, they had lived, and and you know, they didn't find literature always oh, depressing. No, they found that no, this is the way the world really works. Transfiguration. I reread Sula about every other year. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest novels I've ever read. And 
the glory of the language. And I know, I know it was Ohio and all that stuff, but you know, it feels Southern to me. Mm-hmm. It feels like my family. Yeah. That's what I go for in stories. I'm looking for, I'm looking for some echo of the people I've loved most in the world that nobody else seemed to understand. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Oh, honey, honey. I can't read these questions. I'm getting semi-blind. Well, well we're good. Uh, the wind has turned. The fires are at a distance. We're hopeful. Of course, well, as soon as fire yeah. season's over, it'll yeah, be flood yeah, season. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> Spirit of acceptance. That's my new motto. I've got it written on a piece of paper up on the wall. All right. I, yeah. It's but not I a very southern thing. Seriousness, though. Yeah. Did you have questions, son? Your, the third book. I can't remember oh, your yeah. name. The young I'm back. Hi. Sam. <laughs> Thank you. It's been so great to listen to the two of you um, all, just just on everything. Um, and I hope everyone out there has been enjoying as well. Really, truly, it's just a just a conversation um, between between old friends. And, and you, uh, Dorothy, you just reminded me I need to reread Sula as well. I think that is one that you've just it, got. It'll pay of. you. It'll it'll help. It really, it, yeah, it's, it's I'm not a big rereader, but um it's definitely that's one that I feel like we need to get something that you need something else out of it every single time. Every time, um, yeah, it's different as you get older. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine. It's it, it's been a few years, so that's yeah. reread Sula. I think that's if, if anyone takes <laughs> one thing away from this. Um, we do have time for for a couple of questions, and uh, if anybody has a question out there, I encourage you to drop it into the ask a question button. I'll also just remind you that right above the ask a question button, there is the buy the book button, and that does take you directly to a link to purchase a copy of In the Valley by Ron Rash. Uh, just out in hardcover, and uh, this is the book we've been discussing this evening, and you, you can pick it up from us here at Third Place Books, and we will ship it to you anywhere in the country, or you can pick it up at one of our three stores, so I uh, hope that you will uh, check that out. It is a, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big book. It's going to be a special book, I think, so um, yeah. highly recommend. Uh, and again, if you have a question, go ahead and drop it in there. Um, you know, one thing that we we sort of touched on a little bit earlier before uh, we began, and, and a question I would love to um, kind of explore now. Serena, the character, is um, she's a she's a difficult person. She's a pretty uh, <laughs> some some people could say evil even. And Ron, I wondered what what drew you. You talked a little bit about some of the characters, some of the other characters, kind of in her world that you wanted to talk about as well, but. What drew you back to Serena and what was it like writing her now in 2020, 2019 and 2018 in in these recent years? Was that different than writing her the first time? Well, I had to, I had to go back and reread the novel. That was, (laughs) that was an interesting experience. And uh, I'd actually never, I don't think I'd ever reread one of my novels because uh, when I do that, I always find so much. I wish I'd done better, but, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, as I, you know, kind of said earlier, that I just felt that particularly what's happening with national forest and and that kind of devastation, that I needed to go back and uh, address some of those issues again. But she is a a fascinating character to write or for me to write about, and and I I think one thing that's kind of interesting, I think Dorothy may agree with me. Sometimes the most fun characters to write are the <laughs> ones that are most diabolical. Yeah. Uh, and so it was kind of fun to go back and see her. But also one thing that I thought would make this different was now we see her in a sense, completely unleashed. You know, she, she's already gotten rid of her husband. She's gotten rid of her competitors. So we're really seeing her for the first time where she has total control. And um, that I think makes her in some ways even more frightening because uh, she, she has uh, broken free of any restraints and uh I've always seen her in many ways as a, a very Nietzschean character. And um, she certainly, I, to me, I, I actually I've never articulated this, but there's something about her that wants to destroy the world. I mean, there She's really a is human a human rattlesnake. And that she, 
you know, it's almost as if she knows she she is human and will die, but she's going to take the world with her. And uh, unfortunately, that's a little relevant right now. Well, she would if she could. She is a human rattlesnake. And I think one of the things that startled me that you did in that story is that you gave the detail of how she manipulates and tricks anyone who does business with her. So they will always lose. She's the definition of ruthless. And, and I think, it, you know, one thing that I find interesting about sometimes even the most diabolical characters is that they do have a kind of charisma. Uh, and I mean, for me, I mean, you know, just a, we're kind of grown to it. I mean, even if we were, uh, you know, some of the great villains, Barbara, you know, Iago even, and, and Shakespeare. Yeah. For, I mean, there's still something that kind of draws us to them. But I think one thing about Serena is whatever else, she's not a hypocrite. You know, she has the kind of integrity about her. I mean, she, she just comes right at you, and, um, you know, without much pretense. Uh, I mean, she is good. she is able to trick people, but I mean, it's you know, it's it's in a way working with people who are trying to do the same. For her, she's just smart. You know, she she understands uh, human nature in some way. Yeah. Yeah, it is indeed. Uh, I got a couple of good audience questions. Um, this is one that I think both of you can can answer, and it is a very simple one. What made you a writer? Go ahead. I'd have done anything not to be a waitress. Anything. Um, and then, you know, I could have been a teacher, I could have been a waitress. And, but you can do either. You can be a waitress and a teacher and still write. I started writing when I was a seven, eight year old, I started making up stories. Um, and and my, I used to, then I started writing them down. Then I had to burn all the ones I wrote because it was too scary. Uh, no, I, I think I really decided to be a writer rather than just to write. I mean, I would have written anyway, but I was going to be a writer because I became a feminist and I decided to be a revolutionary. Um, and the kind of stories I wanted to write I had hopes of, I wanted to take the world by the throat and make them hurt the way I hurt and glory the way I gloried, make them understand. I think that's what made me a writer. Doing justice to people nobody gives justice to. How about you, Ron? Why? Yeah, well, I, I think that's some of what I felt, particularly with my family. I mean, my parents actually met in a cotton mill, but they, they actually ended up getting it, you know, education. But, um, you know, my, none of my uncles went to college and there was always that sense. Of, and, and my grandmother, my grandfather couldn't rewrite, but um, just kind of honoring their lives in a way, not sentimentalizing them, but just, you know, they were here in the world. But I, I, I didn't start writing, actually writing till I was in college. Um, but I think I was showing the symptoms. Uh, I was a great <laughs> reader, but also was just very uh, content to be by myself, <laughs> maybe a little too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, but I was comfortable that way, and I was kind of comfortable in my imagination. Uh, but when I was about mid-20s, um, I, I really felt I had to, you know, I, I've never wanted to be good at many things, but um, I I, I, I kind of came to a crossroads and my father died and, and pretty young, he, he died young. And uh, I just thought, do I want to live my life risking that I could try this and really commit to it and not be any good at it? Or would I do, I want to live my life without knowing if I could do it. And I, I would rather, I decided I'd rather fail at it. And anybody who read my early work would have said, well, we're betting on failure. <laughs> but I, I stuck it out, you know, and uh, I think that I think kind of what you're saying, Dora, you know, just that drive that you 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 just I feel like this is important enough to where I'm going to make myself a writer. Yeah, the thing I one of the things I do understand about you, Ron, is that you. It seems to me you started with poetry, mm -hmm. and I started writing. What I and I'm frank about it. I wrote bad poetry for most of my adolescence and early 20s. Um, but I went from writing bad poetry to writing decent prose. Um, and when I read 
when I read stories that really touch me, like Sula, the language is a long poem. And I understand I understand that desire to make language sing and the characters you're creating live. Um, it's that that gift that you have for language. Some of it is some I think of it as being your mountain stuff. <laughs> I never said this to you, baby. Uh, but but we were foothills people, but you a mountain person. Um, but still that same kind of glory in language. It, when I hear that and I hear it on the page, Jesus Christ, it gives me hope. It gives me hope. Well, we don't need money to sing. Now. We don't need uh, money to sing. You know, I think a lot of times people think that rural slang uh, dialect, whether it's yeah. uh, Gullah, Appalachian, is yeah. unsophisticated, but I found uh, that's not true. Uh, what, I, what I found, particularly in, at least in Appalachian language, was a delight in saying something in a memorable way. And yeah. uh, I think a way that shows the intelligence, of, particularly of folk languages, is the use of simile. You cannot be unintelligent and, and create a simile. Yeah. So you're dealing with two different things and you're finding a way of bringing them together. And the best one, I've told this before, I've probably told you this, Dorothy, but when I was about 16, I was a tobacco farmer. I went into Boone Mountain, North Carolina with him. Yeah. Uh, and he was going to the hardware store or something. Anyway, there was a, a young woman, uh, probably about 18, 19, and it was summertime. And she was in shorts and, you know, outfit and my uncle saw me looking at her and he said that that gal hasn't got enough clothes on with a lot of shotgun <laughs> and when, when you know I, and, and I can remember when I was in graduate school you know how those graduate students do you know we were talking you know very seriously about poetry and what creates poet, poetic language memorability you know juxtapositions all that you know and and I thought well you know Y'all haven't told me anything, Uncle Howard, you know, <laughs> didn't do in that little similar kid. I think I would have liked your Uncle Howard. <laughs> we, we do have a question, actually, about poetry. Um, a, a great kind of uh, sig here. Um, Frank asks, uh, Ron, any suggestions for poems that you've read or written? that apply to the trauma of today's political situation, today's political polarization. All right. Seamus Heaney, human beings, they torture one another. They get hurt and they get hard. No poem or play or song, fully right or wrong, inflicted and endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. Police widow and veil faints at the funeral. The striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. History says don't hope this out of the grave. And then once in a time, the long for title of justice can fail. And hope and history rhyme. Pray for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. For a further shore, reachable from here. Perfect. That's the best yeah. I can do. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got a question here for you, Dorothy. Are you ready for it? Uh, I'll it try. Is, okay. Uh, what have you been working on lately? Oh my God. <laughs> Other than packing and unpacking and trying to save the garden, um, I I actually am in an awkward place because I a three quarters done with a novel. I wrote three books and they're in the barn, and I never give them to my publisher because they weren't it, stuff happened. I'll talk about that some other time. But um, I had been writing a a book I tentatively titled 1972, and it was. Um, it's about an aging female poet who, uh, through a dent of not magic, but something deliberate, 
winds up back in 1972, um, which was an interesting year, <laughs> especially for music. Um, and that was going great guns. And I was, I was making an editor happy and my agent was happy and everybody's like, come on, come on, come on. And now I don't know. Um, now I'm having to rethink because it is about time and how things change over time. And we've gone through some serious changes in the last couple of months and I'm, I'm rethinking. Um, but I think I see a way through. I think I see a way to keep the book and finish it. Uh, everybody just got to leave me alone for a little while. Like, are, are I would really like it. Uh, no, no, not right now. I'm writing bad poetry in a novel. Lots of bad poetry. It's the only way I can keep my sanity. Well, I mean, Crash is such a wonderful collection. I could pull sections out of the three novels in the barn and publish a half a dozen stories, but I just, I want to finish this novel really badly. You know how that gets. It's like a, it's like a cramp in your belly. You got to get it eased off it's got to be done that and the fact that i have people who are threatening my life if i don't finish this book because <laughs> they've read most of it <laughs> oh, it helps it helps to have people who carry shotguns and talk mean to you or at least yeah. it helps me i don't recommend it yeah. for everybody i'm looking forward to it you made me really happy when i got this book it has made the last week really wonderful so i'll try to give you back a good gift That'd be the best gift. I really appreciate you putting this together, son. I'm talking to you, Sam. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being here. Uh, this has just been this has been a joy. I was, you know, I was so excited uh, to be hosting Ron, and then when when I heard it's going to be Ron and Dorothy Allison, I couldn't I couldn't think of a better pairing uh, myself. So this is. So exciting uh, to have you both here. Uh, we have we have time for for one last question that um, is is a question I often end with. It's really you know it can be a softball, but I think as as we're talking we were talking about earlier and kind of the life saving magic of books, the importance of books um, in a year like this. Uh, what are you guys reading? Anything to recommend? Oh, I just I just read. Um, finished it last night, The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue, which is about uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918. And, and it, is, it is wonderful and heartbreaking and actually gives me, and ends on hopeful. Hopeful. Jesus Christ, everybody dies, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> it's a great book, great damn book. She can write. You read her, Ron? Emma Donahue? I read her. Yeah, this was a good one. Will. Uh, I've read, I actually read a recently a book by a, uh, a friend of mine, and, but yeah. even if she's a friend, she's still a really, really good writer. Uh, and Annette, uh, she's Cherokee, Annette Clapsaddle. Uh -huh. And she's written a book about, uh, not so much about uh, traditional Cherokee, Cherokee culture, but contemporary. And uh, it's called... Uh, as we yet breathe and it's it's really good it's uh, it's coming out from the university of kentucky press i think in about two weeks but is it a novel or it, it has that, just an incredible ending i mean where every it does that thing that sometimes a, a, a novel can do where you get to about the last 20 pages and suddenly it just reverberates back i mean the whole novel suddenly transformed and she's the real deal and uh, that's the book that I've been most excited about. I'm really excited to see it uh, come out. I think it's going to do really well. As yet we breathe. Yeah. I'll look for it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, some, I'm, I'm getting these recommendations. I'm going to scribble them down right now. And yeah, that, uh, that Emma Donahue, uh, I had my eye on that earlier as well. So uh that's those are I, I i always need some good ones um and i'm sure most of the folks out here watching uh do as well one good book that you all need to read if you've not already is in the valley let's get a good image of it in the valley by ron rash uh again really cool cover really beautiful presentation and it's beautiful beautiful story craft um it's a book we're so excited to see out in the world 
please, uh, if you're so moved, do pick up a copy. Uh, you can buy the book at the buy the book link down there at the bottom. I dropped the link in the chat to Bastard Out of Carolina, the uh, great Dorothy Allison novel. Um, and uh, sort of paraphrasing uh, Sam Sifton of the New York Times cooking uh, uh, newsletter. If you haven't read it, you need to. And if you've read it, it's time to read it again. Word <laughs> to live by, I think. Um, thank you so much, Ron Rash, Dorothy Allison. It has just been such an absolute pleasure to have the two of you here this evening. And um, wherever you are out there uh, around the country, around the world, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, it is always our pleasure to, to welcome great writers and uh, certainly these two fit the bill. Um, Ron, good luck with the rest of your tour. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Dorothy, thank you as well. And uh, please be safe out there. We're thinking of you and uh, hope that all, all turns out well uh, there in Northern California. From wherever you are tonight, thank you for tuning in to, with Third Place Books and uh, read good books, do good work, be safe, be well, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, baby. Um, great to, we got to stay connected better. Hell, we could do these for days. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got to go check on the highway patrol, make sure we're still not right. again. Be safe. You guys take care. Bye-bye.